For with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we have this time to be refreshed by a study of your word. Father, we continue to pray for our nation. We pray for our national leaders. We pray for those who are in uh, critical decision-making positions that they will be able to clearly see the truth and understand uh, the issues that face our nation, and they will understand how uh, critical and serious uh, the circumstances are and that they will have the moral courage and fortitude to take the uh, firm stands that they need to against those who would seek to compromise and those who would seek to uh, just uh, continue the same path and keep pushing the problems down the down the road so that they avoid having to deal with them. We pray for leaders who would be more concerned about doing what's best for the country than getting reelected, and we pray for leaders who have uh, real integrity that comes that can only come from the scriptures and who really understand. Uh, reality as you have defined it. Father, we pray for us as we study your word that we might uh, be strengthened, encouraged, so that when we face trials and testing and difficulties in life, uh, rather than caving in or pushing the panic button or feeling hopeless or helpless, that we can put our focus and attention upon you and gain strength and courage from your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 2. Since last Tuesday night, when we first got into this section dealing with the uh, Peter's uh, explanation of the coming of the Holy Spirit, where he focuses on the resurrection of Christ, I, we looked at this passage briefly Thursday night, looked at it a little more on Sunday morning, and back to the same thing again. So it's, uh, all these uh, passages are, are these three different studies, Romans, and uh, Romans and Acts and uh, the uh, Resurrection Special on uh, Sunday are all uh, kind of overlap, but there's different series. Uh, we, we're having a little extra repetition, but I think it's good because it sets a lot of patterns for what's coming up in the book of Acts. It's also helpful for us to understand how the when we look at the scriptures, we can go to these examples from the apostles to see how they interact with unbelievers and how they face the challenges that come from dealing with unbelievers. And sometimes those are challenges that aren't too difficult. Sometimes there are challenges that are that are encouraging. Sometimes there are challenges that are discouraging. But in all of our lives, we have to. Uh, we have to face ways and learn how to do this. I mean, it's not easy for us. So often you find Christians who are just a little cautious or scared or a little nervous about how to how to talk about a lot of things, especially when they're faced with questions and issues that they may uh, not know a whole lot about. And so it's great confidence that we have that ultimately it's not our intelligence, it's not our IQ, it's not our skills at... Um, being able to answer every little question that pops up, but it's just our ability to to faithfully communicate what we know uh, to people who don't know the gospel, and let God, the Holy Spirit, be the one uh, to really make it who really makes it clear to people. That does not, though, excuse us from not doing the hard work of learning and studying, so that we can constantly improve on our own ability to think through uh, these questions and to be able to communicate the answers for people who really are 
uh, seeking answers. And, and they come not just from believers, uh, I mean, not just from unbelievers, but also from believers. And we know believers that are not really on target or they're off the range somewhere wandering around and they ask us questions. Some of them are in rebellion and they just want to kind of put a stick in our eye because they feel all bloated up because they just watched a special on the History Channel. And then there are those who watch something on the History Channel and it just sort of confused them. And so they want to ask us a, a question. I had that happen to me just a couple of nights ago. Somebody saw something and said, now, is that really right? And uh, so I was able to give some information on, on uh, that particular topic. And, and it was just, they just wanted to hear somebody who knew something say, no, it was wrong. And, and that's all they needed. But people, we're all that way. We hear somebody say something. And we don't, we don't know the answer, and they sound knowledgeable, they have a Ph.D., and they teach at some uh, sophisticated school somewhere, and we think maybe, they're, maybe they found something, and most of the time, they, almost all the time, they haven't. They're just repeating old lies and new packages. Now, when we come to Acts chapter 2, to, set the, to remind us of what the context is, because I don't want to lose the forest for the trees as we go through this, the issue is that God the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the chapter descends upon Jerusalem specifically on the place where the twelve disciples, soon to be apostles, are gathered, and there is a sound that everybody in Jerusalem hears. This is akin to what happens on, on Mount Sinai with the voice of God, where if you had been there and had a digital voice recorder with you, you could have recorded this sound of the Holy Spirit coming into Jerusalem. It's not something that happens subjectively inside of people's heads, but it is an objective indicator that God was intruding once again into human history. And along with the, the sound, which sounded like a tornado, the other day after church, I drove up to Abilene, and as I was uh, getting close to a friend's house, I was about 10 or 15 miles away, it, it, it started raining like, uh, like crazy. The bottom dropped open, and I'd kind of forgotten what rain looked like or how to, how to drive in it. And then the sky sort of turned that sea green color. And I was just I was just praying that I could get to his house before anything uh, <clears throat> anything unusual happened. And the Lord managed to just slip me in there when I got in. We were, he was watching the radar on the weather, and just where I'd come from, he just turned into all this hail, and there were tornadoes, and I just managed to slip right through there. So I I didn't get the opportunity to hear a tornado. So from what I have been told, it just sounds like a freight train coming, and, um, and you see all the wind and everything, but uh, that's all they heard. They didn't have anything else. It just a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were, and they see the visual signs of flames of fire over each one of the, uh, each one of the disciples, and then they began to speak in languages that they had neither acquired nor learned. It was a miracle. And then they went out into public, and people are coming out of their ha homes, and of course it's early on the day of Pentecost, so they're going down to the temple to observe, and people are asking, what was that sound? What's going on? And then uh, that provided an opportunity for the disciples to begin to talk about, and all it says is the mighty works of God. And this is a vague phrase, and we can't read into that that they necessarily were talking about the gospel, as I pointed out. They may or may not have, but that is just a vague phrase. It's only used a couple of times in Scripture, and it usually refers to, to the general praise of God for what he has done. But it set the stage, and then there were those who were trying to figure out what uh, caused these Galileans who are had the reputation of not being too bright or too educated to be able to speak in all of these languages, and they were trying to explain it as drunkenness. And so they asked the question in verse 12, what does this mean? Would that we could set anybody up in a witnessing situation to ask that question? Because that's the interpretive question, not what happened, but what does it mean? What does it signify? And that's what we see in Scripture is that God... 
um, it's like show and tell. God does something, and then he tells us what it means. He never separates those two, and he never does something in history that he doesn't explain for us. He always interprets it for us, so we're not left guessing. Of course, if you listen to the liberals, they don't accept the explanations because they think the explanations were what these these early Christians or the uh, ancient Israelites made up to explain these phenomena. They don't. They reject. Uh, they reject the whole idea of direct supernatural revelation to begin with. So whatever is going on here, it just can't be direct revelation. They're, that's how they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. So they ask that interpretive question, what does this mean? And that's what Peter is answering. He, and, and we can't get lost in the details so that we forget that that's what he, the question he is answering. What does this mean? They're asking that interpretive question, and then the the hidden question that's there is, what does it mean for us? What's the significance of, of all of this? And he begins, first of all, the first thing to remember is that he quotes from Joel chapter 2. And he, he quotes from Joel chapter 2, uh, verses 30 and 31, and that's the bulk of the quote from verse 17 to verse 21. And unlike... Um, what I usually do in terms of talking about each verse there, he doesn't do that. He's quoting the context so that he can comment on just one thing at the very at the very beginning. And he's making an analogy. And I want to remind you about the four different ways that the Old Testament quotes like this are used in the New Testament when a New Testament writer says, uh, this is fulfilled by, or this is the fulfillment of. The first way is a literal prophecy that is fulfilled in a literal event. Like when Micah says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and then the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. The second way is a is a typological application where you have something that happened historically but it foreshadows or pictures a pattern or something specific, for example, in, uh, in the life of Christ. And we might even say that the Passover lamb is a type that is fulfilled in Jesus. And so there's a typological application, and then there's just another, uh, uh, the third way was just an application. Something happened historically, there's a principle or one common element there, that is the common element in what's happening in the New Testament event. And so the writer is basically saying, this is like that. And that's what we have here. And then the fourth way is the summary, where the Old Testament doesn't ever specifically say something. For example, the Old Testament never said Jesus or the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. But the term a Nazarene had an idiomatic value that somebody wasn't very bright, wasn't very well educated, and it was a term of disrespect. And the Old Testament did teach that the Messiah would be treated with disrespect. And so that's when Matthew says he would be called a Nazarene. It's really sort of a summary, an idiomatic summary of what the Old Testament teaches. And that's important because we're going to look uh, tonight at these uh, quotations that Peter has from Psalm 16, Psalm 110, as he makes application to uh, the crowd there. So when he cites from Joel, he's really saying this is like what the prophet Joel said. There's a comparison here, just as the prophet Joel predicted that when the Holy, that the Holy Spirit would come and these phenomena would accompany uh, that event uh, at the time of the kingdom, this is similar to that, but it's not the same thing. Then he begins to explain it in verse 22, and we saw that he uh, begins by focusing on Jesus. He focuses on his humanity, because that's an important aspect, his humanity, that he is the fulfillment of those Old Testament promises that as a man he would die and be raised from the dead. If you focused on deity, you couldn't focus on the resurrection. You have to focus on his humanity. So he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him, him being de delivered by the uh, plan of God 
or the previously determined plan of God and his prescience or his knowledge beforehand, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. But we'll see at least one passage later on tonight where the Gentiles get the blame rather than the Jews. So this verse, as I've warned you several times, is not to be used in a uh, ripping it out of context and use it to justify uh, any form of anti-Semitism. That's one of the most horrible things that has happened down through the church age is Christians justifying hatred or antagonism for the Jewish people because they crucified Christ. Just a, a huge number trusted in Jesus. So we can't blame uh, all of the Jews for the acts of those that did this in history. So he was, uh, he says Christ was delivered by the um, plan of God and the pre- prescience of God. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified him, and put to death whom God raised. Now the focal point here is the resurrection as the final acceptance of God, the ultimate acceptance of God, of, the, of Jesus, and the validation of the resurrection. God raised him having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now that's a very strong statement because Peter's saying it's impossible that the Messiah could have been kept in the grave. Well, how can you say that? So he's going to support it by going to a quote in the Old Testament, which is what we looked at the last time. This is about where we finish with some overlap with the last couple of lessons on uh, Resurrection Sunday and last week. Here's Peter's explanation. For David says concerning him... I foresaw the law, the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence." Now, remember what he did with the Joel passage? He quotes all of those verses, but he only talks about a couple of things within the verses. The writer of Hebrews does the same thing when he quotes the whole section in Joel, uh, excuse me, in Jeremiah uh, 30, 31 to 33, uh, regarding the new covenant. And all he emphasizes is that because it says it's a new covenant, that indicates the old covenant would be temporary. He doesn't deal with anything else in the passage. So this was a typical way at the time of citing scripture in support of what you were you were doing. So the real focus is on verses 9 and 10, the joy. And the question here that comes up is, is, is David, who writes the psalm, is David talking about something in his experience that foreshadows or is a type of something that the Messiah would experience? Or is David consciously aware of the fact that he is writing predictive prophecy. Now, how are you going to tell the difference? You're going to go look at a commentary, and as I pointed out last time in Bible Knowledge Commentary, the Psalms section was written by Alan Roth, and he says that David's talking about himself. And that has sadly become a a majority position by too many evangelicals today on Old Testament prophecy. In fact, one of the uh, one, one of the trends that's been going on for the last 50 years is that more and more scholars are saying that there's no actual predictive messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. And there are others who are writing against that. There's a great book written by Michael Rydelnik, very technical in the Hebrew, uh, dealing with a lot of uh, technicalities in the Hebrew and the Masoretic text called The Messianic Hope. Michael Rydelnik is the head of the Jewish Studies Department at Moody Bible Institute, and his parents were uh, Holocaust survivors. When he was in high school, uh, his mother became a Christian, so his father divorced her. And so that upset Michael, so he set out to prove that Jesus could not have been the Messiah. Well, we find out how things like that normally happen, normally result in, and he ended up becoming a believer because he ended up realizing that only Jesus could have been the Messiah. 
And so one thing led to another. He got his, eventually got his doctorate from Dallas Seminary, I believe, and then went to, uh, uh, and he was a classmate of mine, I believe. I didn't know him, but uh, uh, look at the chronology. He must have been. And he went on up to uh, Moody Bible Institute. He's been there. And it's a fabulous book. And he takes on the, these modern trends within evangelicalism to debunk this idea that there are actual prophecies. And he does a fabulous job dealing with history, dealing with the majority text, I mean dealing with the uh, Masoretic text, and a number of other things. So it's just a great book. But there, I want you to be aware that there's this trend. And many times you'll read Psalm 22, you'll read a commentary, you'll hear somebody on the radio teach on on Psalm 110, which we'll look at in a minute, or they'll look at Psalm 16, or they'll look at uh, any number of Messianic Psalms, and they'll say, well, this really isn't a, a prediction. This was just something in David's life that that foreshadowed the Messiah. And that's just not true. David clearly understood in 1 Samuel 23, 1 through 3, he clearly states and clearly shows that he understands that he's, or that should be 2 Samuel, rather, 23, he, that he clearly understands that he is writing about the Messiah. And then when we add Peter's divinely inspired comment here, Peter makes it very clear that, that, that David understood this. He says, uh, at the beginning of his of his citation, he says, "For David said concerning him, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, not concerning David himself, but concerning the Lord Jesus Christ." And then he qu- quotes the psalm. So David, according to Peter, did not think that he was writing about his own experience. And uh, and uh, but the focal point is just on these two verses, specifically sixteen verse ten which says that you, that a reference to God the Father, will not leave my soul, so he's, there we go, Uh, will not leave my soul, which is talking about the Messiah's soul, his life. Often the word soul doesn't refer specifically to soul. It is a figure of speech referring to the person's life, the person's uh, being. You will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One, and that term isn't ever applied to David or to an Old Testament saint. It's a unique term. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. The Greek word, as well as the Hebrew word there for corruption, it relates to physical decomposition of the body. Now, Sheol is the place where the dead went in the Old Testament. And this is made clear in Luke 16, 19 to 25, which is still under the age of Israel. And if you remember the story, the poor beggar named Lazarus begs outside the gate of a wealthy man's house. We don't know his name. He just referred to as the rich man. And Lazarus dies, and Lazarus goes to a place called Abraham's bosom reason it's identified as Abraham's bosom is because Abraham is the patriarch of, the, uh, of Israel in the Old Testament, and he is the one depicted here as the one in charge of paradise, where the Old Testament saints went when they died. And they do not have a, they, they don't go face to face with the Lord because they don't have uh, imputed righteousness yet. It hasn't been given. It, it was some sort of, all we know is God made a provisional righteousness for them until Jesus could die on the cross. So Romans 4, as we'll see when we get there, Abraham receives righteousness, but it's a provisional type of righteousness because until Jesus actually dies, their salvation isn't secure. So in, in, in one sense. So Abraham's bosom is where the Old Testament saints went. Then there's a, the text says, a great gulf fixed. It's just an impassable barrier between that zone and the zone of torments, which was a place of fiery pain. And the rich man is, uh, feels, so he's got some sort of interim body because he can feel 
uh, the pain, and he's thirsty, and he asks for Lazarus to take his finger, so that indicates some sort of uh, interim body, and dip it in the water and put it on his tongue. Again, that seems to be something physical. Now today, another thing you'll read in many by many evangelical commentaries, in contrast to how that this episode has been explained over the centuries, is they try to make this a parable now. And so it's not teaching that there's a literal division like this, and they'll even say there's not a, you can't use this to demonstrate that there is an interim body. And there have been some people, uh, <clears throat> some of you heard here or there, who have uh, used it that way. And parables don't ha- use individual names because they're, they're just made-up stories. They don't have a specific name on an individual. But when you have a specific name given, as we do here with Lazarus, then uh, you, we know it's not a parable. So the other er- so torments is where the Old Testament unbelievers went. And then there's a third section called Tartarus, which is where the fallen angels of the Old Testament are chained in darkness, according to 2 Peter uh, chapter 4. They're in chains of darkness. Now what happens is that Jesus at the after the crucifixion, after he dies, he goes to Sheol. And he makes proclamation to the spirits that are there. This is in Second Peter chapter two, uh, verse four, and he proclaims the fact that there, because with his death on the cross, their uh, their condemnation, their eternal penalty is secured, and the salvation for the Old Testament saints is also secured. So he goes and he proclaims the truth to them, and then takes captivity captive, and he takes the Old Testament saints that are in paradise to heaven. And according to 2 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul goes to paradise, and it's not, it's in heaven, and it's no longer in Sheol. So uh, Jesus empties out the compartment of Abraham's bosom and moves paradise to heaven so that all that is left is torments. And so Hades, or Sheol, now, since the cross, refers to where the unbelievers go. It's not the same as hell. That's a different word. Usually it refers to Gehenna. Traditionally, we've understood Gehenna to refer to uh, the Valley of Hinnom, which is to the south and a little bit to the uh, southwest of Jerusalem, just west of the Valley of Hinnom, ran just west of the old city of David. And the story that I've always heard and that I've read many, many commentaries is that the Valley of Hinnom was said to be the place of burning because this is where they burned their trash. And when I first saw it, I thought that was kind of odd because people were living right along those slopes and you just wouldn't want all that smoke going up. And if you study carefully what's going on in in, uh, Kings... It was in that area that they set up idols to Moloch where they sacrificed the, their infants on the fiery arms of Moloch. And so that is really the source of the fiery image of Gehenna. There's no evidence archeolo- archaeologically that it was ever a trash dump. It was ever a place where they burned their refuse. So the the source of that image had to do with the fires of the false prophets where they uh, immolated their children. Now in Acts 2.29, uh, Peter begins to address the people. Again, he's focusing on the male leadership. It might have been, he might have been uh, at a place within the temple at, where they're inside the court of the women where all that were there, his whole audience, were just males. He says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. Now he's going to explain the application of this this verse. He said, David uh, is both dead and buried. That means David couldn't be talking about himself because the psalm clearly states that God would not allow his Holy One to go through decomposition. Well, David's decomposed. His skeleton's probably over here on Mount Zion under the grave. We know exactly where his grave is. Uh, where his grave is. In fact, 
King Herod rifled David's grave, and there are many people who believe that was one of the reasons that he was under uh, a little divine discipline was because he tried to uh, be a grave robber on uh, David's grave. Uh, That is uh, reported by Josephus, but we're not sure that that's actually, uh, actually occurred. So Peter's argument is that David died, he's buried, he has gone through physical decomposition, and because of that, he could not have been writing about himself. He was writing about someone else. He must have been writing about the, the, the Messiah in the future. Therefore, verse 30 says, being a prophet. Now, that's another important thing to realize. David is a prophet. Now, he doesn't serve in the office of prophet. I remember some years ago, a, a young student asked me, so what's the basis for saying that there's a distinction between the office of prophet and the gift of prophet? And this is one of those verses that uh, supports that. David it does not have the office of prophet. The office of prophet was a very special office in Israel. And while David was king, he's still under the authority at some level of the prophet. The prophet would come as as uh, Nathan did when uh, David committed his sin with Bathsheba and conspired with uh, uh, conspired to have Uriah killed. And after he, he did that, then he's guilty of adultery, he's guilty of conspiracy to cover it up, he's guilty of murder. And so Nathan came and gives him this little parable, uh, which David just walked right into and, and announced his own condemnation. And the point is that God and the law is over the king in Israel's system. And so when the king violated the law of Moses, then it was the role of the prophet to come and announce the judgment on the king. This happens also with Elijah and Elisha and a number of a uh, number of the other prophets. This is why uh, the rebellious kings would get so angry. Why uh, it was probably Manasseh that had that was so evil that had uh, Isaiah uh, sawn in half, and many other prophets were uh, killed and tortured uh, and m- executed because they didn't go along with telling the king what he wanted to hear. So there's a difference between the office of king and the office of prophet. But David held the office of king, but he had the gift of prophecy, the gift of a prophet, as Daniel did. Daniel did not have the office of prophet. Daniel served as the second in command under Nebuchadnezzar and later uh, under, uh, Be- uh, under uh, Darius. And when Nebuchadnezzar was out uh, feeding on the grasses in the pasture, Uh, It was probably uh, Daniel that held the kingdom together uh, during that time because he was the had the highest position in the land under the king. So there's a distinction between the having the gift of prophet and the office of prophet. So here Peter is saying that David was a prophet. That means he is also involved in telling uh, future events within the plan of God. Therefore, being a prophet. And second, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Now that's important. When did this oath occur? Uh, the Psalm 132.1 tells us that God swore an oath to David that his heir would not uh, that his heir would sit on his throne. So Psalm 132.1 is a summary of the Davidic covenant, specifically 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, where God said, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up, and it's interesting that the rabbis who translated that word from the, from the Hebrew into the Greek of the Septuagint used the Greek verb anastaso, which is the classical Greek form of the verb anhistemi, and it's related to an- anastasis, the, the noun for resurrection in the, uh, in the New Testament. So there, it, this doesn't, I'm not saying this proves the resurrection, but it sim- clearly implies the resurrection. 
If we didn't have any other passages, you couldn't go to 2 Samuel seven twelve and say, see, this is the resurrection. But having the other passages, you certainly see that the implication is here by the words that are used. I will set up or raise up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So uh, there's clearly a God is making this covenant, a legal covenant, a binding covenant uh, with David, and in that covenant, he's establishing the oath that uh, that the God would fulfill that covenant and his descendants would sit on his throne forever. Then in verse 31 we read, He, that is David, foreseeing this. Now there's another interesting word that we find that is that we talked about one form of this word back in verse uh, 22 or 23 rather when it talked about uh, the Messiah being delivered by the uh, determined plan of God the word there was uh, horizo horizo and this is prahorizo and prahorizo here means to see ahead of time so again it's talking about foresight. It is not talking about uh, Calvinistic predestination or some sort of, of uh, fatalism. Uh, that is not part of what is going on here. So he says, He, that is David foreseeing or looking ahead, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. So Peter's very clear that Psalm 16, 8 through 11, is clearly predicting the resurrection of the Messiah. So David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that is the Messiah, Christos, the Greek word for Christ, is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach for Messiah. Concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So the flesh, which is the physical body in the grave, would not have gone through decomposition, and his soul in a interim body would not have been left in Hades, but he, would, he was resurrected. And then his conclusion is given in verse 32, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Now this is an extremely important term in the book of Acts, this word witnesses. And if you go back to Acts 1.8, we remember that when just before Jesus ascended, he gave his par- parting words, his parting order to his disciples. He said, you shall receive power, stay in Jerusalem, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then when Peter and the other uh, apostles decide to select a replacement for Judas. One of the requirements was that he was had been with Jesus from the beginning, from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, and one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's this clear understanding that their role is to function as legal eyewitness, eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And during this time in Jerusalem and then later in Judea and Samaria, they keep talking about the resurrection, but they're talking to people who were there. If there had been some subterfuge, if Jesus hadn't died, if Jesus had been somehow spirited away and they're just making it up, this would have easily been discovered. They're talking to people who were eyewitnesses of everything there and clearly understood that, uh, that what they were talking about was what had actually happened. So um, then we get into Acts 2.32, the verse that we're looking at here. The, uh, Peter says, This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. In Acts 3.15, in his next sermon, he says that uh, the Prince of Life was killed, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. In Acts 5.32, Again, we find him saying, we are witnesses, we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. In Acts 10.39, Peter says to uh, Cornelius, we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. 
And then two verses later, he says, not to all people, that Jesus didn't appear to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So those of you who are concerned about eating and drinking after you get a resurrection body, you can do it, and you, apparently you won't put on any weight. So you just have to be able to postpone your bluebell fix until you get your resurrection body, and then you can just have all you want. And I'm sure they're going to have bluebell in heaven. They won't have that other ice cream made by those Marxists up in Vermont, but they'll have bluebell there. All right. Uh, in Acts 13.31, here uh, Paul is talking and says that he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. So again and again you have this, uh, this idea that there's an objective legal witness to the resurrection. There's not just two, which is what was demanded by the law, but there are not only the 12 of the, the uh, apostles, but there are also all of, the, uh, all of the others that he appeared to. For example, he appeared to 500 up in Galilee. And so all of these are witnesses of his resurrection. In Acts uh, 22.15, Paul says, for, uh, in, re- in restating this, he says that Jesus' command was, for you will be his witnesses to all men of what you've seen and heard, and then in Acts 26, 16, again, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister. This is uh, Paul telling the story of what Jesus commanded him to do uh, at, when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. And so this idea of witness is crucial to the book of Acts. So Peter uses the term again here in verse 32. This Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. It's amazing change that one day, here you have Peter, and Peter is scared to death and refuses to admit that he even knows Jesus or that he even hung out with Jesus, and now he is willing to stand up in front of one and all, in front of everybody, and uh, proclaim this, that he is a witness of the resurrection. How do you explain such a change from a cowering coward to this incredibly brave, uh, confident individual if you can't explain it by the fact that he actually saw somebody come out of the grave and somebody uh, be restored to life from death? Now in verse 33 we read, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. So now Peter is shifting... He's been talking about just the resurrection, but the resurrection didn't just stop everything. Jesus wasn't still just walking around because God's plan goes forward. And so the Messiah was to be elevated to a position to the right hand of God the Father. And that, again, is established by an Old Testament principle and an Old Testament prophecy. So he shifts now from and is making his transition from Acts 16 to Psalm 110, uh, verse 1. Uh, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now uh, see and hear. Uh, So Jesus is exalted to the right hand of the Father, and now he is going to... um, Go to Psalm 110 to demonstrate this, that this was what was predicted of the Messiah. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. Now, the word that is used here to translate poured out, that's translated poured out, is a Greek word, E-K-C-H-E-O, and It is just a generic word for something being given. And that's what this describes. It's not a word that talks about the indwelling specifically or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the filling of the Spirit. It's just a general word that now the Holy Spirit is being given to believers in a way that never had happened previously in history. So 
that Jesus had to be exalted to the right hand of God before this could happen. And of course, he, for Peter, he would be going back to what Jesus had taught them the night before the cross in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, that Jesus had to leave, but he would send another, that is another of the same kind, another uh, comforter uh, to them. So Jesus had to be exalted to the right hand of the Father, and in that exaltation there is a delegation of a certain amount of authority given to Jesus as the head of the church, and he is given, delegated this authority related to the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Holy Spirit, and then it is Jesus who poured out this, which you now see in here. So see how he starts off with this is what the prophet Joel said, or this is like what the prophet Joel said, and then he segues from that to Jesus as the Son of God. He is Jesus the of Nazareth, who was killed, uh, delivered up by the foreknowledge of God, I mean the uh, predetermined plan of God, and he is given, uh, and then he's raised from the dead, and now he ascends to heaven so that he can distribute the Holy Spirit. Well, that looks like a nice conclusion there in verse 33. And then he goes to his next quote, which is in Psalm 110. I don't have this, a slide on these verses. He says, but for David did not ascend into heaven. See, just as David went into the grave and his physical body uh, went through decomposition, so uh, David can't be talking about himself in uh, Psalm 110 verse 1. Incidentally, there are a number of evangelical scholars now who uh, try to argue that uh, David is talking about himself in relationship to God the Father. Uh, in contrast to how Jesus interprets Psalm 110 and how Peter uses Psalm 110. This is one of the problems that you get in this sort of very narrow blinders on View, way, way that we've compartmentalized the study of theology. You have these Old Testament Hebrew specialists who want to interpret everything in the, in, in the Old Testament as if the New Testament didn't exist. And it's a, it's a, a very poor way of doing scholarship, and it do, actually destroys true biblical scholarship. So verse 34 again, but David did not ascend into heavens, but he says himself... The Lord said to my Lord, and in the Hebrew text, the first Lord uses the sacred tetragrammaton, the four letters that are used to, to present the formal personal name of God. It comes from the Hebrew verb, uh, hayah, meaning to be. And so as God explained what his name meant to uh, Moses, he said, uh, I am that I am. It indicates that he is the self-existent one. Uh, we don't know exactly how it was pronounced. The first syllable is Yah, and we know that because it's a, it's a concluding um, suffix in many, many names, like Zechariah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. That last syllable is the uh, first syllable in the name of God. The second seems to be pronounced uh, like weh, so it'd be Yahweh. Now, most of you are aware that uh, the Jewish people have always had such respect for the name of God that they don't pronounce it. So in the Masoretic text, they would put the Hebrew vowels from the word Adonai, which is the second word here for Lord, um, and Adonai was placed, those vowels were placed under the four letters for the name of God to remind the reader to say Adonai instead of Yahweh, so he wouldn't read Yahweh. Today they often use the phrase Hashem, which means the name. And they will use that instead of God, or sometimes when they're writing, they will put G hyphen D, and sometimes you'll see that, because they just don't want to state the name of God. Well, God in English is really just a generic term like uh, Elohim was in the Old Testament. So here we have two different Hebrew words. The Lord, that first one where you see in your in your English, it's in lower caps, is, represents Yahweh. The second Lord is Adonai. So the Lord, uh, Yahweh, said to my Lord. So who's in authority over David? 
within the Mosaic structure, there's no one higher than David as the king. So this would also refer to deity. And so we have two divine personages here, and one says to the other, sit at my right hand. This is a position of privilege and responsibility until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, within the plan of God, the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father as the Son of Man until he is given the kingdom. And that's not given, according to Daniel chapter 7, until just before Jesus descends to the earth or just before the Son of Man comes to the earth to take uh, take the kingdom and establish his kingdom upon the earth. But all David is asserting here is that, that he's taking Psalm 16 and says, this shows the Messiah was supposed to be resurrected from the dead. Psalm 110 shows that he's going to go to heaven where he's going to be seated at the right hand of God. Now, when you put this together, we learn that he has to be glorified and exalted at the right hand of the Father before he can distribute the Holy Spirit. So his conclusion then comes in verse 36. Therefore, when you see it, therefore, you always have to see what it's there for, and it's there to start his conclusion. Let all the house of Israel know. Now, who's he talking to here? It's a Jewish audience. There's no Gentiles here. They haven't had any, really any new revelation about the church, just some hints from some things Jesus taught them that something was going to change. But he's still addressing an all-Jewish audience. He's still addressing men of Israel. And guess what? This is where we, when we went through all the introduction to Acts. He, it's a transition period. He's still offering the kingdom to Israel. And this is so important for understanding a verse that's uh, coming up that it really confuses a lot of people. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And by that he is meaning not what lordship salvation mean, people mean, or people who say, well, at that point Jesus is given deity. He is, it's, it's a, a phrase that indicates the exaltation of Jesus to his position of glory, actually his return to glory, at the right hand of God the Father. And so he nails his conclusion, which is that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's very clear that he's nailed his conclusion because his audience suddenly responds. And in verse 37 we read, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, which means that to their very soul they realize in their conscience that they have made a, an egregious mistake, a horrible mistake, and they have crucified the Messiah. And so they, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is the second question they asked. What's the first question? What does this mean? Now, Jesus, I mean, Peter has told them that what all of this means is that you crucified Jesus. He went into the grave, he was buried, but he rose from the dead, and he is the Messiah who has now been exalted to the right hand of the Father. And as part of his exaltation, he's been given authority over the church, and he's sent the Holy Spirit. Now they ask the second question, if this is true, what do we do? And the if this is true indicates they know it's true. Now, Peter's answer is what confuses a lot of people. Verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, it's Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, you'll find some Christians, notably Church of Christ, and some others who will say, this verse teaches that you can't be saved unless you're baptized. And I remember when I was a student at Dallas Seminary, and we would go to the Texas State Fair. And back in those days, the Church of Christ had a booth, and they had these Bible question, they had electrical boxes, and they would have about five questions, and you would, you know, have a little metal 
uh, indicator you would stick in A, B, C, or D, multiple choice, and see if you knew anything about the Bible, and that was their hook to get people to come in and start talking talking to them. But they always got around to Acts uh, 2.38 here, that you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus or you're not going to be saved. But that's not what Peter is saying here. First of all, we have to understand that he's talking to a Jewish audience in a particular context. And that context is so important. But secondly, we have to understand the grammar because the grammar really changes what you understand here. First of all, he says, repent. Now, this is the Greek verb metanoeo, which means to change your mind or to turn. And notice, I have the parsing there. It's an aorist active imperative. That means this is the highest priority. Aorist imperatives mean this is a priority command. But it's a second person plural. Now, we all know that a second person plural is, should be translated y'all. So he's saying y'all repent. Now, you've got to pay attention to the plurals and singulars here. Or you'll just get all screwed up and you'll become Church of Christ. He says, repent, and then he says, let every one of you be baptized. Now notice, that's an aorist passive imperative, third person singular. So first of all, he's talking to y'all, and then in this next line, he's talking to the individuals. Now that's very important. It says, this this second phrase is really a parenthetical statement. He says, y'all repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission or the forgiveness. It's Afiemi there, for the forgiveness of sins. And you, and he shifts back to a plural. And y'all, wait a minute, every one of you is singular. Now he's back to plural again. And y'all shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now what was John the Baptist's message? When he came, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that was a present active imperative. Present active imperative doesn't put the priority as high as an aorist imperative does. It's still an imperative, but it emphasizes that this should be a standard operating procedure in the life of people. Well, where did John get his message? Well, we will see it in a minute. He got it from Deuteronomy 30 verse 2. But this is his command. What went along with that? If you read down to verse 11, the sign that someone had repented was that John baptized them with water. And it, was, it says in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So the message of John the Baptist and of Jesus' disciples at the beginning is the same message that Peter is giving here in Acts 2.38. He's still saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and you need to get baptized, but now it's in the name of Jesus. You need to be identified with Jesus. The reason he's emphasizing repent isn't because repent is something you need to do to be justified, because John never uses that word in the whole Gospel of John. Is because for Jews, they're told that after their period of rebellion and the, and, and the cursing and judgments upon them that God describes in Deuteronomy 29, God then gives them hope in Deuteronomy 31 through 3 and says, and after you've been scattered to all the nations and all these judgments have come upon you, and then you return, and that's that Hebrew word shuv, which is translated uh, metanoia, you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will restore you to the land. Verse 3. So all that Peter is saying when he says repent in Acts 2.38, he means the same thing Jesus' disciples meant and that Jesus meant and that, Paul, that Moses told them about back in Deuteronomy 30 is that if you want to get out from under divine discipline on the nation and, and so that everybody's brought back to the land, then you have to turn back to God. And the sign that you have done that and recognize that is that you will be baptized and then we have this phrase for the remission of sins. Now, before we go any further with this, for those who think that Peter is saying you have to repent to get be justified and go to heaven, Peter would be a really confused hypocrite if that were true, because just a few chapters later when he's talking to Cornelius and the Gentiles, he says, 
of him, that is Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now, believe and repent are not the same thing. They're not synonyms. So in Acts 10.43, Peter is clearly saying the issue is believe in him for the forgiveness of sins. Now, let's go back to Acts 2.38, and I'm going to read it once the way it should be, and then we'll rearrange it. Peter said to them, y'all repent. And let, he came from South Galilee. Y'all repent and let every one of you, singular, be baptized in the name of Jesus. That is, every one of you who repent. Let every one of you be baptized for the remission of y'all's sins, and y'all shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's rearrange. Let's take that singular out and put it at the end so that parenthetical phrase doesn't confuse us. Peter is saying, to addressing the men of Israel, that as a nation, y'all need to repent for the remission of y'all's sins, and y'all shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's tying that to the, to the new covenant. And let every one of you who do this individually be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, when we get into this, and we look at it in terms of what the Greek says, the phrase that's translated to be baptized um, in the name of Jesus uh, for the remission of sins, that the for there translates the Greek preposition ace, E-I-S. And it can mean, but usually doesn't mean, on account of or because of. And some people try to ha- solve this by saying that they're being baptized because they've already received the remission of sins. But if you understand how, and you fit this within the context of what John said and what Jesus' disciples said in terms of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it doesn't have the idea so much as repent because you've already been forgiven of sins, but it is unto, uh, that's the direction. It's like repent, like what uh, John the Baptist is saying is you are being baptized unto forgiveness. That's your new state is a state of forgiveness of sin. And then he's, he, he, the, the plurals here still are talking about corporate Israel and receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in relation to the new covenant. Well, I'm going to stop there because we're out of time. I'm going to come back and go over this again because it's really important. And remember, we're talking about transition, that at the beginning of Acts, the focus, the, the offer of the kingdom is still being given to the Jews. This is just another offer of the kingdom. If they would repent, even at this point, and accept Jesus as Messiah, then the kingdom will come. In fact, in the next chapter in Acts 3, Peter uses two phrases that clearly talk about the millennial kingdom. The times of refreshing will come if you will repent. So that re- word repent isn't this you know, walk the aisle and cry and show remorse and all of that. It, it, it simply means to turn back to God. It is Deuteronomy 30, verse 2, addressed to the Jews, turn back to God. And they would, they would understand that. So we'll come back next time. Father, thank you for this time to study these things, to be encouraged by the fulfillment of uh, prophecy in the life and the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us to understand these uh, passages. They're somewhat difficult because of the difficulty of translation. That we may be sure we understand what your word says. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.